All right, guys, well, welcome back. We're going to dig into section 9.2 right now, and it's a rather short section. And in the section that's going to talk about or introduce these terms, these concepts known as unification and lifting, as well as a inference rule for first order logic known as generalized modus ponens. So let's get started. All right, in section 9.1, we were introduced to this idea of propositionalization propositionalization it's hard for me to say um, and that process was able to do some stuff for us that we talked about in section 9.1 right but the thing is is that that process that approach um, it's not the most efficient in the world okay so it would be nice if we could improve on that okay and so that's what this first order inference rule is gonna is gonna do for us All right, so let's say that we run this query, evil X, right? And we want to know if someone's evil. We want to know, hey, tell me what's evil. So this query right here, rather than having to generate new sentences to answer the query as you would, you know, using the propositionalization approach, you know, it doesn't seem obvious that, say, John, Right? John is the evil one. If you take a look at the knowledge base here, these three sentences that make up this knowledge base, you know, we're given that king is that the king John is a king, and we're given that John is greedy. And we have this rule here, this sentence here, an implication that says that hey, anybody who's a king and greedy is evil. Right? We can here's our premise. If you're a king and greedy, we can infer the conclusion that you're evil. Well, we're given sentence King John. We're given sentence greedy John. So as humans, we can look at that by inspection and go, yeah, yeah, John's greedy, or uh, John's evil, right? No, I mean, John's evil, but he's also greedy and he's a king, right? Which is what makes him evil. So that's obvious. I mean, we can look at that. We can see, we can pick it out. Okay, cool. Um, if we could do something similar for a computer, then we can speed things up quite a bit because we don't have to use, you know, propositionalization um, as we did in, you know, as we covered in section 9.1, we can speed things up. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about, right? We're going to talk about how we can do that, and we're going to do that by using um, an inference rule for first-order logic that's known as generalized modus ponens, and then we'll we'll um, you know we'll look at a high level, and at a high level we'll look at a, an algorithm. We'll, we'll touch on it a little bit, and I'll highlight it like I've done for you in the past um, to how this can work, how you could program it. Now, if you're already using a programming logic language or logic programming language such as prolog this would already be provided for you as part of its interpreter or inference engine but if you were going to write your own inference engine then this is definitely an algorithm that you would need to be aware of right all right so let's take a look at it now we know that using john that ground term john for variable x is going to solve the query um you know what's evil right you give me an x that's evil and that's that's going to give us an inference well how does that how does that work right well we use that rule that greedy kings are evil right so we'll go back up there right we're using this greedy kings are evil right so what we did is we found an x so that x is a king and x is evil right um i say and x is evil let me let me rephrase as a mistake on the slide you know we had to find an x so that x is a king and x is greedy and x is greedy right so once we've done that then we can go ahead and infer that x is evil so we plug in john for x right so we've got john for x we've got john for x for the greedy part and so we can go ahead and fill in john for the x so we can fill in john for all three of those pieces and so then we can go ahead and infer that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. john is evil yeah we can do that okay so you know that's a specific example where we plugged in john for x right but we can generalize that right we can say more generally if there's some substitution call it theta that causes all the conjuncts of that implication premise to be identical to existing sentences in the knowledge base then by applying that substitution you can then go ahead and infer or assert that conclusion 
right? So let's go back up here. Right? So we found a substitution, okay? And the substitution was John, right? And if we substitute John in for X for this conjunct right here, that's similar, that's equivalent to a sentence that's already in the knowledge base, right? If we substitute John for the X and the greedy conjunct, well, that's similar to a sentence that's already in the knowledge base. So if you can do that, if you can match up existing sentences for something that you propose to stick in for the X, well, then at that point, you're good to go. You can just say, yeah, yep, it implies, yep, it's evil. Yep, 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 done. Yep, 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 yep. We found a matching sentence. We found one that matches the first conjunct and we found one that matches the second conjunct. Good, we're done. Yeah, we can go ahead and say that John then is evil, not a problem. All right. All right, so we can make this work even harder for us, right? So let's assume that we replace we replace one of those sentences in the knowledge base, right? So let's say that instead of having a uh, greedy John, right? Let's say that we were able to delete this and replace it with uh, this sentence right here. For all Y, greedy Y. This basically means if, you know, Y is a person, then Y is greedy. If we know that everyone is greedy because of that sentence and not just John, then John is still going to be evil. Right? We more generalized, you know, our, our, our sentence here, you know, that we use universal quantification to say that everyone's greedy, not just John, right? But we can still use this. We can still, we can use it. We can still infer that John is evil because John's a king. That sentence is still in the, in the knowledge base. That never changed, right? And we also know that John is greedy because everyone is. But to make this work, right, to make the inference go you have to still do your substitutions so we need to substitute something for the variables in the implication and we have to substitute something for the variables in the knowledge base so remember that implication is this guy right here right for our, for all x king of x and greedy x implies evil x and remember we replaced greedy john with for all y, greedy y. So we need substitutions for x and for the y to make everything work, okay? So if we take this as our substitutions, our theta, right, we'll substitute John for X and we'll substitute John for Y. Okay, now in the implication premises, right, for those conjuncts, well then John goes into King, all right, for the King's X. John goes into, oops, John goes into the greedy X. But in order to make everything work, because remember, we have to match up the conjunct with an existing sentence. Remember, the, the sentence that we have that replaces John being greedy is this one. So that's why we have to have a John for the Y variable, right? So that's where this comes in. So then that will make King John match up with King X and doing Y for the greedy here Right? That'll make greedy John, and then in the implication, that conjunct, using John for X will make those two guys match. So this will be one sentence in the knowledge base. This will be one sentence in the knowledge base. We substitute John for X, we substitute John for Y, and so that makes that conjunct match this sentence, makes this conjunct from the implication match this sentence, and at that point, it's safe for us to go ahead and infer our conclusion that John is evil. So that's an example of generalized modus ponens, right? So here it is kind of written all out all kind of fancy, but look on the right side here, right? On the right side, this is just a bunch of atomic sentences all joined together by conjuncts implying some conclusion Q. 
left hand side you got a bunch of atomic sentences and these were ones that are already separate in the knowledge base right so um, you know you have to have some variable that would cause conjunct p1 or some substitution for a variable that would make conjunct p1 match sentence p1 not one for conjunct p2 to match sentence already in the knowledge base a separate sentence knowledge base p2 and so on and if you can do that for every conjunct then you can go ahead and infer logically speaking it's safe it's fine you can infer you know your conclusion you can assert the conclusion that's sometimes referred to okay so in this example we just did king john was in the knowledge base that would have been p1 not and p1 is king x that's the first that's that first conjunct, right? And P1 not was one of the sentences in the knowledge base. P2 not, right, was in our knowledge base, greedy Y. So there's P2 not. And then the other conjunct, P2, is greedy X, right? And so what was our substitution? John for X, John for Y, right? Q is was our conclusion, evil X. And so if we substitute John for X, right, we get... King John as part of the conjunct, and then we have already have sentence King John in, in the knowledge base. We substitute Y for greedy, then we get a sentence greedy John. And then if we substitute John for X and greedy X for that conjunct, then we got matches. And so then you can go ahead, logically speaking, it holds um, that you can assert your conclusion that John is evil. Right, so this is an example, as I was saying, of generalized modus ponens, as it's called, and this is known as a lifted version of modus ponens. So we did some lifting here. So what that does is that raises modus ponens that we looked at in the variable free propositional logic that basically makes us have a version that is working in first order logic because we got variables, right? So what's the why what's the what's the what's the advantage here you don't have to go through that entire process of propositionalization I'm kind of shocked that i said it right a lot of syllables there so what's the advantage you only need to make substitutions or only you need to make those substitutions that allow the inference to proceed for it to go on you don't have to plug in richard you don't have to plug in any other ground terms that you have you only need to do the substitutions you need to get the inference that you're looking for. So let's talk about unification, right? So what's unification? That is process you go through. That's what you're doing to try to figure out what substitutions you need, right? For generalized modus ponens, right? So that process of trying to figure out those substitutions, that's unification. So unification, Key thing, you're going to see this again when you're going through the prologue tutorials. You're going to, you know, you'll run into this talk about unification. So unification, the ability to do this, to do these substitutions, you have to have it. You have to have that built in to any first order inference algorithms um, that you might come up with. Right. So the unify algorithm, which I have right here, right, we'll come back to it. What that thing does is it's going to return a unifier if you give it two sentences, right? So you got sentence P, you got sentence Q, and if possible, if there is a unifier to be found, it will return one for you. It'll identify it for you, and it'll and it'll um, you know, return it if it's possible. If there is a substitution that'll make it work for these for these two sentences, okay? So. Uh, it returns some unifier theta where you're doing a substitution of theta into atomic sentence P, and that's going to be equivalent to a substitution for your of your unifier into sentence Q. All right, so let's look at an example of that. So let's say that you're trying to figure out, you know, who does who does John know, right? You have a knowledge base, and you're trying to figure out who does John know. Right, so you remember that ask vars um, interaction that we defined uh, in the previous sections, right? So we're trying to figure out, hey, tell me everybody that John knows. So we got an X in there. 
So who does he know? What does he know? Right? So the answers that you're going to get out, all the results you're going to get are going to be all of the knowledge based sentences that can successfully unify with this right here with John and X. Okay. So we're trying to find all of those sentences where we can have a substitution for X that works for both sentences to make them equivalent, right? So here's an example of unify being passed a couple of sentences, right? So we're trying to find a substitution to see if John knows Jane, right? So the uh, first sentence here knows John X. Well, there's your P, right? The second one knows John Jane. That's your Q, right? Now, what's the unifier? The unifier would be Jane for variable X because putting Jane, substituting Jane for X in sentence P makes P and Q the same. So your unifier, Jane. So you can then infer that John knows Jane, right? Um, let me give you another one here. Um, what about, you know, does, we're trying to figure out does, you know, is, is John going to know Bill, right? So, you know, here, is there going to be some unifier, some substitution that you can do to where P and Q are going to be the same, right? You want to see knows John comma Bill for the, for P and you want to see knows John comma Bill for Q, right? Well, as it turns out, if we plug in Bill for X for sentence P, that will say John, Bill, John comma Bill. And if we can plug in um, John for Y, right? Well, then that second sentence becomes John knows Bill, right? And so by doing those substitutions, P and Q become the same. And as a result, you can infer that John knows Bill. So look at this fourth example. Is there a unifier for a sentence P that says, you know, John knows X and for sentence Q where it says, well, somebody knows the mother of that somebody. And that's basically what that's saying. Um, somebody knows their mother, right? Um, so somebody knows the mother of that somebody. <laughs> so is there a unifier? Yeah, I mean, if you were to plug in John for Y, then you look on the right hand side and that says um, knows John, mother of John, right? John knows the mother of John, which makes sense. You know your own mother right now. If you plug in for X in sentence P, you know, the mother of John, well, then what does sentence P become? John comma mother John. So that would match sentence Q, which would be knows John, mother John. Right. So since that works, that's a unifier that makes those two sentences P and Q the same. And so then you can infer that John knows his mother. Right. Now, if you take a look at this last one. Right. John um, and X, um, you know, John, the sentence P knows John X and then um, sentence Q knows X Elizabeth. There's nothing here that we can provide for X that would make them the same. And so because of that, that fails. And so you can't then say that, um, you know, John knows Elizabeth because let's say, cause you look at that, right? Let, let, look at sentence Q and you're like, well, I'll just plug in John for, for X, right? That should work. Well then sentence Q knows John Elizabeth. Okay. That looks fine. But then go look at sentence P, right? If you substitute John for X, you'd be saying, knows John, John, <laughs> they're not the same sentence. Therefore, because by generalized modus ponens, you can't infer that John knows Elizabeth. They don't match. Right. X can't be John and Elizabeth simultaneously. Right. All right. Um, let's see here now, but everybody knows Elizabeth, right? So you say, and that last unification is going to fail because X can't be John and Elizabeth simultaneously, right? So go back here and you take a look, right? You can't have, you know, this X over here, the sentence P, that can't be Elizabeth. But then over here, it can't be, 
John, so they don't match, right? That's why it fails. But, you know, if you take a look at the second sentence, what you're saying is that everybody knows Elizabeth, right? So doesn't it, shouldn't it be able to work, right? I mean, if everybody knows Elizabeth, John knows, John somebody, it doesn't work because we can't make the sentences the same. So what's the problem? X is the same variable. So how do we fix this? Easy, just change the variables, right? Use different variables, use an X and a Y. So for this sentence P, John comma X, sentence Q, um, Y comma Elizabeth, right? So there's a term for that, and that's called standardizing a part, right? So if you take a look at this unified sentence here, Right. If we say, all right, well, John X and knows X 17, sub 17. That's just that's just the new name for the variable. OK, um, I'm stealing from the text. They called it X sub 17. So there you go. So here, then we can come up with the unifier. We can come up with a substitution where X is Elizabeth. So in sentence P, John comma Elizabeth. And then we can come up um, with the substitution for X sub 17, John. And so then that makes sentence Q knows John Elizabeth, so they're the same, and now we found ourselves a unifier. And all we had to do was change the name of that variable in that second sentence, and it works. All right, so keep that in mind, especially when you're writing your prologue program uh, as you're building your um, expert system, right? You're, you're gonna, you could run into some issues, um, you know, where you're trying to use you know, the same variable, you know, for, you know, for your facts and you're having problems with the unification, um, you know, understand what's going on here, understand the need for doing this um, standardizing apart and when it's applicable and, you know, when it's not. Okay, anyway, so there's another complication that can prop up here, that can crop up here. You could have, um, through a unification attempt, you could end up with multiple unifiers. You can have multiple substitutions that solve your problem, that create the two sentences, P and Q, that are the same. So, for example, we're trying to unify, we're trying to find a substitution um, for these two sentences here that make them both work, right? So this is saying, hey, John knows someone, and this is saying someone knows somebody, right? Uh, so what could our unification effort return? Well, you could have John as a substitution for Y. Right, so you go over here and you say, oh, okay, well, John knows Z, right? And then over here you've got uh, John knows X. And then to make them both the same, you could have as a substitution Z for X. And so then you end up with um, John knows Z and John knows Z, and that's your unifier. Okay, there you go. Okay, both of them are the same. Or you could have something like this. <laughs> Right, here's a unifier where John just substitute for Y, John substitute for X, John substituted for Z. And so you're saying John knows himself, right? You can infer that John knows himself because substitute John for X and you're saying John knows John. And then for the second sentence, substitute John for Y and John for Z. And you're saying, well, John knows John. So you're referring John knows himself. Isn't that wonderful? Right? So you got two different unifiers that could, that could satisfy this problem. So um, you can say that the first unifier, this one right here, this is said to be more general, okay? There's fewer um, restrictions on the variables themselves, right? In the second example, you said, well, John goes to X, John goes to Y, John goes to Z. You know, since we're using a variable to substitute a variable, there's fewer restrictions as to what values actually get assigned uh, to what variables, or I should say what term gets assigned to what variables. Right, so an inference engine would have to have some way of dealing with this, um, and or you may need to um, rewrite your rules, right? Rewrite your sentences to avoid this kind of ambiguity. All right, so keep that idea of standardizing a part in mind as you're working with your prologue program and building your expert system. You know, when you're choosing variables for your different facts and rules. Okay, and. Keep in mind how failure can crop up just because, you know, you use the same variable name, right? So just keep that tucked away in the back of your head. That's, that's a common thing, at least when I was working with Prolog, when I'm playing around with it. I mean, that's usually bites me in the backside, kind of like when you forget 
that uh, a single equals is not checking for equality between x and y um, in an if statement in say C++. Uh, okay, anyway, so here's another complication for you. Um, you know, you could have multiple unifiers. All right, so let's take a look at unify here, right? Unify, we're trying to figure out, you know, John knows somebody, right? So that's the first sentence, sentence B. But you also got this other sentence, you know, Y knows Z, right? So this first one is saying, well, John knows somebody. And the second sentence is saying, somebody knows somebody. So what could the unifier be for this? Well, if we have Z as a substitution for X, and we have John as a substitution for Y, this is a unifier. It will make both P and Q the same. So imagine if Z is the substitution for X. So that first sentence becomes, knows John Z, okay? And then what about the second sentence, right? Well, you substitute John for Y and that becomes knows John Z, right? So that's a unifier. But you could also get this unifier, right? Where you just assign John to Y, John to X, and John to Z. And if you do that, then you're having a situation where you're saying, all right, well, uh, John knows John, and John knows John, right? Because the X becomes John, the Y becomes John, and the Z becomes John. That unifies, right? And you've got a substitution that makes it work, so you can infer that John knows John. Okay, um, so which one do you go with? Well, the inference engine is going to have to, you know, that whatever you're using, however you program it, it's going to have to have some way of dealing with that. Um, but, you know, there's some terms for this, you know, these, if these different types of unifiers. You know, the first unifier here, this is said to be more general than the second. You know, why? Because there's fewer variable restrictions. And the second one, you're saying John goes to Y, John goes to X, John goes to Z. In this first one, you're saying, well, Z goes to X. Well, Z itself is a variable. So one of those variables is kind of left free, right? Which may or may not be a problem because if you have, um, you know, you're, you're going through your unification process and you've assigned um, Z to X, right? So you've got John uh, knows Z and John knows Z. Well, what's Z? You'd have to go through another unification process to find out, right? It almost becomes a two-step recursive process. Okay, so that's why it's, um, I guess you could say that's why it's more general because the unification can continue from there, right? All right, so that's kind of how the uh, algorithm, the unification algorithm works, right? At a high level, we'll just say this, just throw a couple points at you and then we'll skim over it. Now, it's not important for you to memorize this algorithm or anything like that. The uh, expert system you're going to write using Prolog, it's going to go ahead and um, do this for you, right? But if you were to write your own inference engine, then you'd have to implement something like this. But essentially what this does is, you know, you're recursively exploring both of those expressions, both of those atomic sentences at once, right? And um, as you're going through and plugging in substitutions, right? If there's corresponding points in the structures that is being generated, um, basically you're creating a couple of different trees. And if at any point those trees don't match, right? Level for level, node for node, um, then the unification fails, okay? So the example in the text is, well, look, you know, you might have this sentence S of X. Well, at a certain point, you know, um, at the same level, one of the substitutions becomes S of X 4X, right? Um, if you were to do S of X 4X here, then that sentence, that version with that substitution doesn't match. And so you're not gonna be able to unify. All right, so let's take a high level look at the unify algorithm. And let's, uh, you know, I'm just gonna point out you know, at a high level the different pieces of it. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to hand trace through it on your own. As far as test goes or anything like that, I'll ask you some general questions. You're not gonna write code for this. I'm not gonna have you on a test, hand trace through this or anything like that. And for your expert system, you're not gonna write this. Prolog does it for you. That's built into the Prolog interpreter because when you 
do some queries of your expert system, the prolog interpreter is going to go through your list of facts and rules, and it's going to try to unify uh, some of those facts and rules to uh, determine whether or not you can make an inference in one of your rules, right, that to satisfy your query. So you won't write any of that. Now, if you were writing your own inference engine from scratch, well, yeah, you'd have to implement some form of this unification algorithm, but you don't have to worry about that. Prolog handles it all for you. All you're doing in your prolog assignment is writing a text file that has all of your rules in it, right? all those facts and all those rules. Uh, anyway, so let's read this subtext together here. The unification algorithm, what does this do? Compare structures of the inputs element by element. So X and Y, you can see the uh, arguments up there. X, Y, and theta, X and Y, they can be, those inputs can be variables, constants, lists, or compound expressions. And theta is the substitution that could serve to unify the two sentences that gets built up um, so far, right? So as the recursion proceeds, that substitution gets built piece by piece by piece. Okay. Um, and it's used as it's being built up to make sure that later comparisons that are done are consistent uh, with the bindings that you had earlier. So what are bindings, right? John to X, Z to Y, um, Elizabeth to X, right? So th those were examples of the bindings. Uh, let's see here. Uh, compound expression, what's that? So you got something that looks like this right here, right? Looks like a function call, F, uh, A comma B. Well, this, I mean, you can imagine, you saw this already, right? So when we talked about nose, right? So the F would have been nose, A would have been John, and then B was our X. Okay, so the op field, so you can look up here in um, the body of the algorithm, X dot op, Y dot op. So what that does is that picks out the function symbol F, right? So it would be like X dot F, Y dot F being passed. And the args field picks out the argument list, A comma B. So you can see... Uh, where it says x dot args y dot args and so this is saying all right well that would be um x dot a you know this list right here a comma b uh, y dot args uh, a comma b right so that's what that's referring to so i won't go through the entire thing but um you know if at any point in the process your solution equals failure then you return failure you know, if X equals Y, then return the, the, the theta, return that substitution. Because what does that mean? It means that the sentences are both the same. And so that's kind of, that's your, that's one of your base cases, right? So you got two base cases here. Either the substitution is set to failure or the two sentences or those two structures that were passed are the same. And so whatever substitution you had built up to that point, that's, that's what unified it. So return that substitution. Okay, um, if x is a variable, then you call then you call the unify var uh, function, which could do um, some indirect um, recursion, calling unify again. Um, you can check also to see if, if if variable if x is not a variable, then check to see if y is, and so you know you're just calling unify var again, but swapping the arguments. You know, checking uh, to see once you're inside that function, you're checking to see well is that binding. Uh, var and val um, is that already an element of the substitution if it is then you got your um, recursive call to yourself um, if val is if the value that's being passed here is um, bound to x and that's an element of you know if there if there's some binding that's an element of that substitution that's what this is saying then go ahead and, and return this unify here uh, you're checking for um, an occurrence of error here if they don't if they don't match. Uh, otherwise, if you get through all of that, you can just go ahead and return a binding of x to some variable, right? Whatever this is to some variable, that's your binding. Add that to your substitution. Um, you're going up here, you're checking to see if they're compound, and then you're pulling everything apart and doing your recursive um, call to yourself, continuing building up building up the uh, substitution. If they're not both compound, if they're both lists, then you're going through and you're recursively calling yourself and continue on. Um, where instead of passing, you know, just the structures themselves, since they're lists, you're passing as the first two arguments, um, the rest of the list for 
the first structure, the rest of the list for the second structure, and then a recursive called the unify where you're passing the first element of the list for the first structure and then the first element of the list for the second structure along with the substitution as it's been built up so far. Now, if all of that fails, well, then there is no unification, return failure, it's over, forget about it. Okay, so anyway, um, I think I'll just leave it at that, you know, giving you an idea. Here's the side-by-side -side comparison of the elements. You know, you're checking to make sure that, you know, they're both compound, they're both lists. If one of them is a variable, go ahead and do your unification where you're doing putting your bindings together um, and then uh, adding them to the substitution. Um, so I think, I think that's all I want to say about that. Okay, so again, you don't have to know this. You don't have to memorize this. You know, just generally be aware of what's going on at a high level so you can answer a true, false, or multiple choice question about it. And again, Prologue did this for you. You don't have to worry about it. All right, so that's section 9.2. I rambled on long enough. Um, the uh, next, the last little bit of 9.2 um, just talks about, you know, how tell and ask uh, uses some additional helper functions. Forget about it. We won't worry about it. Um, you know, the textbook even says so. Hey, you know, you didn't, on first reading, you don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know, you don't need to know anything. And this is only if you want to make um, this process more optimized where they go into a discussion on it. And we won't worry about that in the interest of time. All right, so when we come back, um, we'll talk about section 9.3, which is forward chaining, um, which, you know, we, we mentioned in previous sections, we talked a little bit about forward chaining and backwards chaining, and you had a little bit of a exercise on that. Um, We'll look into it in more detail, uh, 9.3 before chaining, in the context of first order logic and inference, and then we'll come back and we'll look in more detail at uh, backward chaining in section 9.4, and then that'll be it for the for the chapter, right?